Hello, and welcome to another edition of Dated Stories, a show dedicated to stories and storytellers. I am your host, Tamar, aka the, AKA the Palm Tree. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, today, we'll be finishing up part two of uh, Ernest Hemingway's The Capital of the World. Um, last episode, we did the... Um, we did part one for Capital of the World, but today we're going to be finishing up on this story, um, part two. Okay, so we left off at um, when the meditor was saying, leave me alone. Okay, and she repulsed and refused um, and felt the nakedness of his cowardice returning. Okay, so let's um, resume with part two. Leave you. What hasn't left you, said the sister. Don't you want me to make up the bed? I'm paid to do that. Leave me, said the matador. His broad, good-looking face wrinkled into a contortion that was like crying. You whore. You dirty little whore. Matador, she said, shutting the door. My matador. Inside the room, the matador sat on the bed. His face still had the contortion which, in the ring, he made into a constant smile, which frightened those people in the first rows of the seats, who knew what they were watching. And this, he was saying aloud, and this, and this. He could remember when he had been good, and it had only been three years before. He could remember the weight of the heavy gold broaded fighting jacket on his shoulders on that hot afternoon in May when his voice had still been the same in the ring as in the cafe, and how he sighted along the point dipping blade at the place in the top of the shoulders where it was dusty in the short haired black hump of muscle above the wide wood knocking splintered tip horns that lowered as he went in to kill and how the sword pushed in as easy as into the mount of a stiff butter with the palm of his hand pushing the pommel, his left arm crossed low, his left shoulder forward, his weight on his left leg, and then his weight wasn't on his leg. Whew, that was a long sentence with a bunch of commas. <laughs> his weight was on his lower belly, and as the bull raised his head, the horn was out of sight in him. And he swung over on it twice before they pulled him off. So now, when he went in to kill, and it was seldom, he could now not look at the horns and what did in any whore know about what he went through before he before be fought. And what had they been through that laughed at him? They were all whores. And they knew what they could do with it. Down in the dining room, the Pisador sat looking at the priest. If there were women in the room, he stared at them. If there were no women, he was still with enjoyment at a foreigner. Un- un- English, but lacking women or strangers, he now stared with enjoyment and awesomeness at the two priests. While he stared... The birthmark auctioneer rose and folding his napkin went out, leaving over half the wine in the last bottle he had ordered. If his accounts had been paid up at the Lorisar, he would have finished the bottle. The two priests did not stare back at the Pisador. One of them was saying, It is ten days since I have been there, been here waiting to see him. And all day I sat in the antechamber, and he will not receive me. What is there to do? Nothing. What can one do? One cannot go against authority. I have been here for two weeks, and nothing. I wait, and they will not see me. We are from the abandoned country. When the money runs out, we can return. To the abandoned country, what does Madrid care about Galicia? We are a poor provenance. One understands the action of other of, of our brother, Basilio. Still, I have no real confidence in the integrity of Basilio Alvarez. Madrid is where one learns to understand. Madrid kills Spain. And they would simply see one and refuse. No, you must be broken and worn out by waiting. Well, we see, I can wait as well as another. 
At this moment, the Pisador got to his feet, walked over to the priest's table, and stood gray-headed in hawk, hawk face, staring at them and smiling. Ah, Terrero, said one priest to the other, and a good one, said the Pisador and walked out of the dining room. Gray jacketed, trim waisted, bow legged, and tight breeches over his high heeled cataman's boots that clicked on the floor as he swaggered quite steadily, smiling to himself. He lived in a small, tight, professional world of personal <coughs> efficacy, nightly alcoholic triumph, and uh, insolence. Now he lit a cigar and tilted his hat, had an angle in the hallway, and went out to the cafe. The priest left immediately after the pice door. Hurriedly, conscious of being the last people in the dining room, and there was no one in the room now with Paco and the middle-aged waiter. He cleared the tables and carried the bottles into the kitchen. In the kitchen was the boy who was wash, who washed the dishes. He was three years older than Paco and was very cynical and bitter. Take this, the middle-aged waiter said, and poured out a glass with the valdez piñas and handed it to him. Why not? The boy took the glass. To Paco, the older waiter asked. Thank you, said Paco. The three of them drank. I'll be going, said the middle-aged waiter. Good night, they told him. He went out and they were alone. Paco took a napkin one of the priests had used and standing straight, his heels planted, lowered the napkin and with his head following the movement, swung his arms in the motion of a slow sweeping Veronica. He turned and advancing his right foot slightly, made the second pass, gained a little terrain on the imaginary bull and made a third pass, slow, perfectly timed and suave. Then gathered the napkin to his waist and swung his hips away from the boy in a media veronica. The dishwasher, whose name was Enrique, watched him critically and sneeringly. How was the bull, he said. Very brave, said Paco. Look! Standing slim and straight, he made four perfect passes, smooth, elegant, and graceful. And the bull, asked Enrique, standing against the sink, holding his wine glass and wearing his apron, Still has a lot of gas, said Paco. You make me sick, said Enrique. Why? Look. Enrique removed his apron and signed the imaginary bull, the sculpture for perfect language gypsy, Veronica's, and ended up with a rebelera that made the apron swing in a stiff arc past the bull's nose as he walked away from, from him. <clears throat> Look at that, he said. And I wit and I wash dishes. Why? Fear said Enrique. Miedo. The same fear you would have in a ring with a bull. <laughs> no, said Paco. I wouldn't be afraid. Liche said Enrique. Everyone is afraid. But a Torero can control his fear so that he can work the bull. I went in an amateur fight and I was so afraid I couldn't keep from running. Everyone thought it was very funny. So would you be afraid? If I wasn't for fear, every book black in Spain would be a bullfighter. You a country boy would be frightened worse than I was. No, said Paco. He had done it too many times in his imagination. Too many times he had seen the horns, seen the bull's wet muzzle, the ear twitching, then the head go down and the charge. The hoof stunning and the hot bull passed him as he swung the cape to recharge as he swung the cape again, then again, and again, and again to end winding the bull around him in his great meteor Veronica and walk swingly away with bull hairs caught in the gold ornaments of his jacket from the close passes. The bull standing hypnotized and the crowd applauding. No, he would not be afraid. Others, yes, not he. He knew he would not be afraid. Even if he ever was afraid, he knew he could do it anyway. He had confidence. I wouldn't be afraid, he said. Enrique said, Liche, again. And he said, if we should try it, how? <laughs> Look, said Enrique, you think of the bull, but you do not think of the horns. The bull has such force that the horns rip like a knife. They stab like a bayonet, bayonet and they kill like a club. Look, he opened a table drawer and took out two meat knives. 
I will bind these to the legs of a chair. Then I will play bull for you with the chair held before my head. The knives are the horns. If you make those passes, then they mean something. Lend me your apron, said Paco. We'll do it in the dining rooms. No, said Enrique, suddenly not bitter. Don't do it, Paco. Yes, said Paco. I'm not afraid. You you will be when you see the knives come. We'll see, said Paco. Give me the apron. At this time, while Enrique was binding the two heavy bladed razor sharp meat knives fast to the legs of the chairs, with two soiled napkins holding the half of each knife, wrapping them tight and then knotting them, the two ch chambermaids, Paco's sisters, were on their way to the cinema to see Greta Garbo and Anna Christie. Of the two priests, one was sitting in his underwear, reading his brevi breviary, <coughs> and the other one was wearing a night shirt and saying the rosary. All the bullfighters, except the one who was ill, had made their evening appearance at the Cafe Fornos, where the big, dark-haired Posado was playing billiards. The short, serious matador was sitting at a crowded table for a coffee and milk, along with the middle-aged Benderilla and other serious workmen. The drinking, gray-haired Pesador was sitting with a glass of Sazalas sa brandy before him, staring with pleasure at a table where the Metador, whose courage was gone, was gone, sat with another Metador who had renounced the sword to become a Benderilera again, and the two very houseworn looking prostitutes. <coughs> the auctioneer stood in the street corner talking with friends. The tall waiter was at the narco synologist meeting, waiting for an opportunity to speak. The middle aged waiter was seated on the terrace of the Cafe Alvarez drinking a small beer. The woman who was who owned the Luasa was already asleep in her bed, where she lay on her back with the bolster between her legs. Big, fat, honest, clean, easygoing, very religious, and never having ceased to miss or pray daily for her husband, dead now twenty years. In his room alone, the matador who was ill lay face down on his bed with his mouth against a handkerchief. Now, in the deserted dining room, Enrique tied the last knot in a napkin that bound the knives to the chair legs and lifted the chair. He pointed the legs with the knives on them forward and held the chair over his head with two knives pointed straight ahead, one on each side of his head. It's heavy, he said. Look, Paco, it's very dangerous. Don't do it. He was sweating. Paco stood facing him, holding the apron spread, holding a fold of it, bunch in each hand, thumbs up, fingers First finger down, spread to catch the eye of the bull. Charge straight, he said. Turn like a bull. Charge as many times as you want. How will you know when to cut the pass? asked Enrique. It's better to do three and then a media. All right, said Paco. But come straight. <laughs> huh, Torito. Come on, little bull. Running with head down, Enrique came toward him and Paco swung the apron just ahead of the knife blade as it passed close in front of his belly. And as it went by, it was, to him, the real horn. White tip, black smooth, and as Rike passed him and turned to rush again, it was the hot, blood flank mass of the bull that thudded by and turned like a cat and came again as he swung, the cape slowly. Then the bull turned and came again, and as he watched the ongoing rush point, he stepped his left foot two inches far forward, and the knife did not pass but had slipped in easily as in to a wineskin, and there was a hot scolding rush above and around the sudden and rigidity of steel, and Enrique shouted, Hey, hey, let me get it, let me get it, out. And Paco slipped forward on the chair. The apron, the apron kept, cape still held. Enrique pull, pulling on the chair as the knife turned, turned in him, in him, Paco. The knife was out now, and he sat on the floor in the widening, warm pool. But the, put the napkin over it. Hold it, said Enrique. Hold it tight. I will run for the dogs, and you must hold in the hemorrhage. That should be a rubber cup, said Paco. He had seen that used in the ring. I came straight, said Enrique, crying. All I wanted was to show the danger. Don't worry, said Paco. His voice sounded far away. But bring the doctor. 
In the ring, they lifted you and carried you, running with you, to the operating room. And the femoral artery emptied itself before you reached there. They called the priest. As advise one of the priests, said Paco, holding a napkin tight against his lower abdomen. He could not believe that this had happened to him. But Enrique was running down the Calais San Geronimo to all to the all night first aid station and Paco was alone. First sitting up, then huddled over, then slumped on the floor until it was over. Feeling his life go out of him as dirty water empty from a bathtub when the plug is drawn. He was frightened and he felt faint and he tried to say an act of contrition and he remembered how it started. But before he said, before he, before he had said as fast as he could, oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee who art worthy of all my love. And I firmly resolved he felt too faint. And he was lying face down on the floor, and it was over very quickly. A severed femoral artery empties itself faster than you can believe. As the doctor from the first aid station came up the stairs, accompanied by a policeman who held on to Enrique by the arm, the two sisters of Paco were still in the moving picture, Palace of Gran Villa, where they were intensely disappointed in the Garbo film, which showed the great star and miserable low sur- surroundings where they had been accustomed to see her surrounded by great luxury brilliance. The audience disliked the film thoroughly and were, po- were protesting by whistling and stamping their feet. All the other people from the hotel were doing almost what they had been doing when the accident happened, except that the two priests had finished their devotions and were preparing for sleep. And the gray-haired Pisador had moved his drink over to the table with the two house-worn prostitutes. A little later, he went out of the cafe with one of them. It was the one for whom Metador, who had lost his nerve, had been buying drinks. The boy Paco had never known about any of this, nor about what all these people would be doing on the next day and on the other days to come. He had no di- he had no idea how they really lived nor how they ended. He did not even realize they ended. He died, as the Spanish phrase has it, full of illusions. He had not had time in his life to lose any of them, nor even at the end to complete an act of contrition. He had not even had time to be disappointed in, in the garbo picture, which disappointed all Madrid for a week. Well, listeners, that concludes our story for today. Um, thanks again for uh, tuning in. Um, this completes our show for today. Um, again, I'm your host, The Palm Tree. Um, thanks for tuning in. You have just we have just wrapped up part two, or finished part two of um, Ernest Hemingway's The Capital of the World.